Ooh, wait, hold up. Whoa. We gotta stop for a second. Hold up. Let's go. <laughs> wow. AJ presents Just your delivered. thoughts. <laughs> Just delivered. Um, it looks fantastic. AJ? Does he travel with that thing? No. <laughs> that is that is tremendous. Good for Why you, not? Ken. You one up us all. <laughs> that is fantastic, Ken. Wow, that threw me off in a good way. Uh, so well, great to see you. To you guys, I didn't exactly come up with it, so you know, <laughs> let's give credit you know where credit's due. It's all like yeah. I went to your store and said, "Let's do this." Of course you did, <laughs> because you know how I know you did that, Ken. Your head fits perfectly in the little V that's there. <laughs> Just whatever. I'm like always thinking about pictures, AJ. Thinking about making uh, you happy, man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. See? It's on his mind. I'm if sure only other people in this it. world would do that, Ken, it'd be a much better world. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> well, anyway, if you're listening to the pod, uh, check out the YouTube version of the show. It's a great look of the foul and fair territory logos. Okay, let's get to business. So we read your notes column from over the weekend. We started talking about the Orioles and Dylan Cease, which we talked about quite a bit, and mixing in a little bit of Jesus Lazardo as well. If the Orioles don't pull, I get it on your on the side of hey, if they, they don't have to trade Cease or Lizardo. If the Orioles don't do anything at all this offseason, I mean, obviously we know what the fan reaction is going to be. Is this still the team to beat? And do you think they internally are feeling heat to have to do something on the trade front? They would like to. I would put it that way. I don't know that I would call it heat. Because they're still going to have a very formidable team. Whether it's the AL East champion or not, again, I don't know, but even without another starter, they've got Bradish, Rodriguez, and John Means, and they've got Tyler Wells, and Dean Kramer, and D.L. Hall. They have bodies, people who can do it, and two of those guys, Bradish and Rodriguez, are front-of-the-rotation types, but they still haven't replaced Kyle Gibson's 192 innings from last year, and we all know they entered the offseason looking for an ace. That is the one thing this team needs the most. They addressed the loss of Felix Bautista by signing Craig Kimbrell, but they still are looking. Now, there are a couple of ways to look at this. They have this loaded farm system. Why don't they just give the White Sox what they want? That's, of course, one way to look at it. The other way is, hey, if no one is getting Dylan Cease, and certainly there are 28 other teams that want him as well, for the most part, because he's affordable to everyone, then maybe the White Sox price is so high that he's not getting traded and you really can't fault the Orioles if no other team pulls this off. I don't know where exactly this is going to fall, but if they open the season with the current group, which I imagine they would supplement with James Paxton or Mike Clevenger, someone in the second tier, it's okay. It's just not what it could be. And then you say, well, there's always the deadline. And that's true. But the problem with the deadline, and actually an Orioles person explained this to me, this time of year, teams like the Yankees and Dodgers can sign free agents. They can sign Yamamoto if you're the Dodgers. You can sign Stroman if you're the Yankees. No big deal. Come the deadline, there's no free agent market. Everyone is focused on the same group of starting pitchers. So the competition is even fiercer. That is the problem that the Orioles would face if they do not get an ace-type pitcher in the offseason via a trade. Are we making too big of a deal out of it? Because this is the team, exactly the team they have, minus Batista, that won a hundred and some games. Are we making too big of a deal out of it? And if the Orioles don't do anything, don't make a big splash. I'm not saying James Paxton, he's a big leaguer. Clevenger is a big leaguer, so that's not doing anything. Is that a vote of confidence? As much as the Reds not doing anything at the trade deadline is a vote of I'm not sure we're quite there yet. I would say it's a little of both. They think they're there. I don't know that there's any question about that. And they certainly are deep enough in prospects where they can make a Dylan Cease type trade and still be deep. They've got one of the best farm systems in the game. So the bigger thing for me is they lack what Gibson gave them last year. Kyle Gibson is not an ace, but Kyle Gibson threw a lot of innings for a younger staff. Now, all of these players are a year older. In theory, a lot of them could get better. But as we know, prospect development isn't always linear. You don't just always see it going like that. So there could be some regressions among some of these players. There could be injuries, of course. And from that perspective, you really want to see them do something. And I'm sure they want to do something. But the way they see it, if the White Sox want player A, B, and C, and it's just too much, they're not going to do that just to do it. And then the consequences will be what they are, if they are at all. 
Let's face it, this division is kind of interesting. The Yankees are unquestionably better, but are they this complete, wonderful team without questions? No. The Red Sox, they have yet to make their major moves, in my opinion. The Blue Jays have not made major moves, and the Rays are kind of in between, as they always are. They've traded glass down, they've done a couple of things, but are they as good as they were last year? I'm not sure. So from that perspective, the Orioles might be okay. They don't look at it that way. No team does. No team says, well, the rest of the division is not so good. We don't have to do anything. They want to be better, but the demand for these starting pitchers right now in trade is high. The prices are high, and it's difficult to pull off. Let's face it, guys. The only starting pitchers, the only ace-type pitchers traded this offseason, one was Chris Sale and the other was Tyler Glass now. That's it. Shane Bieber staying put for now. Corbin Burns, staying put for now. Luzardo, the Seattle starters, all of these guys we've talked about, only Sale and Glass now have been traded. Okay, Ken, you might say they're deep. I think they're being cheap. <laughs> Again, what, because, I mean, you have they have all these prospects, and they're doubled up on some of them. The one thing that they need, and we know they need, is starting pitchers. They need more depth in their rotation. Yes, the, the guys Bradish and – Means and, and some of these guys are, are Kramer. Yeah, they're good. And, and I think Bradish has a chance to be very good. He was very good for him last year. But they need a bona fide ace starting pitcher where they go out every fifth day and say, okay, we know what this guy's going to give us. This guy takes the ball every fifth day and he's going to give us six innings, give us a chance to win. Not that those other guys can't do that, but they need a guy that's established. And if they do that, then I think they're right in this division, not only. To, to win it, but possibly finally advance in the playoffs and make a deep run. If they AJ, don't we're do on it, the same page here. I totally agree with you. They need that I, guy. There, there's not I a mean, question in my go mind. Buy, go 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 get us now. Go get a Montgomery. They well, have money. They're not going to do that. I, I know, but they should. John Angelos. I know he's sitting at home yeah, going one dollar, two dollars. Kind of <laughs> have you ever seen Scrooge McDuck where he goes in the hot tub with all the money? <laughs> yes. That's what Peter or John uh, Angelos is doing. I mean, right in now. theory, a AJ. Let's look at it just from a baseball perspective. Money's not involved. If you could sign Blake Snell and you're the Orioles, that's perfect. Left-hander in that ballpark, that works really well. It all makes sense. They're just not in a position in their minds where they're comfortable doing that financially. And that's John Angelos. It's not Mike Elias. I'm sure Mike Elias, the GM, would like to sign a Jordan Montgomery or a Blake Snell. But that's not where they are now. Maybe they'll be there one day. I don't know have much confidence in that with this present ownership but again that is where they are so you have to talk realistically about what they might do and what they might do are the things we're talking about cease lizardo etc and that seems to be difficult to pull off now maybe you overpay and teams today are so reluctant to do that they all hoard their precious prospects if ever there was a team that could do it it's the orioles and as i wrote if they hold all of these kids, they may ultimately regret it because they may not be able to get the pitcher that they want in a trade, ultimately. We kind of follow the same narrative of the Cease, Burns possibly, Bieber possibly. I think they're both going to stay where they're at. Lazardo kind of hopped in there. Is there a chance we see, and I'm just going to give you two examples, of a Wheeler on his last year and a Max Freed on his last year? Those two teams, the Phillies and Braves, looking at a Jordan Montgomery and a Blake Snell, if extensions don't happen, is there a chance teams could say, hey, you know what? We'll trade this guy so we can sign this guy since we don't see us resigning. Is there is there example not examples of that, but is there opportunities for teams that could possibly strike in that sense and really like shake up the market? It's a great question, Eric. I hadn't even thought of it that way, but I don't see it. The Phillies want to extend Wheeler. He's been a success in Philadelphia. Not every pitcher, not every player can succeed in Philly. So that is something that they clearly are signaling, and I expect that to get done in spring training. Free is going to be more difficult to pull off, but even if they do not sign him, they're still going to want him on their team. You can make the argument, well, you trade Max Free, and then you go sign Jordan Montgomery. I guess, but then you're playing into Scott Boris's hands too, and I don't necessarily see that happening. So in my opinion, both those guys stay. It's an interesting thought, and Eric, we can apply it even to other players. A team may be trading its closer to sign Josh Hader, right, along those mm -hmm. lines. 
these things are always possible, and sometimes we see moves along these lines occur, but I don't see it with Freedom Wheeler. So, Ken, I want to double down on Snell. There's been quite a few comments um, in the YouTube chat today asking if you know Boris is overpricing him. I know you covered that a little bit as well recently. So I wonder if it has to do with owners being burned in the past as much as it has to do with Blake Snell because they look and go, well, there's risk and pitchers like this are expensive. Plus, I guess the perfect storm of some teams that are just not spending. This is definitely a down off season. It seems like with some teams that just are not interested in spending like they used to. So what do you think this has to do with more with Snell and the risk and the concern or the way the market looks at someone like Snell these days? Both. And certainly he is a fascinating guy in this market right now. He is a two time Cy Young winner. Guy is accomplished. Now, in the three, four years between the two Cy Youngs, he had a 3.85 ERA, still slightly above league average in those years. And he's not somebody who just stumbled in the years he didn't win the Cy Young. He just wasn't as good. So you look at him and you say, well, the high walk rate, he doesn't go deep into games. All of these negatives are associated with him. At the same time, my goodness, we're not talking about some guy who pulled off the street here. He's a pretty accomplished pitcher. And the point Boris made to me, and every time I write about him making a point, people freak out. But the point he made was that you don't need high volume as a starting pitcher to get paid these days. And the examples he used and I used in this notes column were DeGrom, Carlos Rodon, and Tyler Glass now. None of them are high-volume guys. In fact, Snell, in the four years previous to this one, pitched more innings than any of those guys did in the four years previous to them signing. Now, obviously, Rodon and DeGrom are not great examples of guys who succeeded with their contracts, at least in Rodon's case and in DeGrom's, not yet. But the point he was making and the point that some readers got lost here, these guys still get paid. That is what's going to happen with Blake Snell. He's going to get paid. Is Boris overpricing him? Of course he's overpricing him. That's why he's not signed right now. There is going to be, at some point, a happy medium. And I don't know what the number is, and I don't know which team it is. But Blake Snell, I don't expect to sign a pillow contract, put it that way. He's too good. And even with the high walk rate last year, one of the highest in some time, I think since Matt Clement many years ago for a starting pitcher, he pitched to a 1.20 ERA in his last 23 starts or so, he was able to get out of it. You don't like to live that way. I get it. But he is not some bum out there. I, people <laughs> are kind of taking Blake Snell a little bit and discounting him a little bit too much from me. You know, Boris can bring up DeGrom all he wants, but the Rangers did win a World Series last year. So, you know, whatever they spent well, on DeGrom. DeGrom is a better pitcher than – Snell is okay. Degrom, of course. Right. When he, he's, when he's, he's when healthy though. Yes. When, when healthy. When healthy. Okay. So Snell hasn't figured it out, which I still am amazed. There's not at least four or five teams just banging down his door because there's a lot of really good places he can there go. Might San be, Francisco. Uh, might uh, it just doesn't make sense. So that that's why Boris is is now in almost defense mode, which I get because now he wants to find a place and he has to, and time is running out. But I want to talk about the Rangers. They haven't done much this off season. They, yeah, they did. Yeah, they won the World Series. Yeah, they did big signings. Yes, they have, you know, Degrom maybe coming back. Scherzer's coming back at some point, but Jordan Montgomery's still out there. He fit in nicely. In them are they going to make a move this off season, or like we talked about the Orioles, are they just standing pat and saying, "Hey, we're, here's your vote of confidence. We won last year. We're good for the next forty years." They're different than the Orioles because their entire situation is impacted by ownership's view of their regional sports network's future, and they're one of the Bally's teams. They're going to be okay for 2024. They might not be completely whole, but one way or another, they're going to be in a decent position. The question that ownership has, and I would dispute that this is a real problem, but this is the way ownerships view things sometimes. They're worried about 25 and beyond. So they're worried about what things are going to look like in the future. We all know that once all of this gets sorted out, that Teams are going to be just fine for the most part. Maybe they won't be quite as fine, or maybe they'll be better off if you're the Texas Rangers and you have a superstar-laden team that can really sell itself direct to consumer. If I were them, I'd go sign Jordan Montgomery. My gosh, they've made a ton of money with the World Series championship, and they're going to make more because the first year after a World Series title is always a big year for revenue. 
But that's where ownership is right now. Do I expect this to resolve? I'm not sure. And they can say, yes, we're going to be okay even in this particular situation because it's not just DeGrom and Scherzer. It's Tyler Molly coming back in the second half as well. They will have a line change at the All-Star break of different pitchers coming in. And beyond that, Heaney and Scherzer and one other, I can't remember who exactly, comes off the payroll after this year. Possibly Nathan Evaldi. He's the other one. So they should have the flexibility to do this in theory, but ownership right now seemingly wants more clarity on the future RSN revenues. And that, to me, what I understand is what is holding this up. One more for you, Ken, um, with the Cubs having their convention this past weekend, getting a lot of questions about what you think the Cubs still could do, because I, I got to look at the direct quotes. It's not like they said they're in like the fourth or fifth inning of their offseason right now. OK, well, I hope that means that they haven't spent like half the money they're going to spend. They're only going to spend another 50 because this is really the offseason that they should strike. It actually looks like a great opportunity for them, given the talent that's still on the market. And we're having trouble coming up with a number of teams to match with some of these players that are at the top of the board. They still need another left-handed hitter, even after getting Michael Bush. I thought that was an interesting trade. That was a way to get one left-handed bat into the lineup. Bellinger is the most obvious fit for them. Whether it happens or not, who knows? Beyond that, they've got him in Aga now for the rotation. Ideally, would you like to see them add a little bit more? Yes. They're replacing Stroman. Who knows if Imanaga will be what Stroman was for them. Last year, you'd probably have to bet against it, at least for the first half of the season, when Stroman was an all-star. So it was encouraging to hear Hoyer say that, in my opinion. And I don't think he meant, Scott, that they spent half their money. He meant that these things are still evolving and they could still make another trade. Their system is rather deep. They could still even sign a couple of free agents. So I'm interested to see what they're going to do here, but I would expect that, indeed, they are not done. Okay, good. You made everyone, or at least the people that care in our chat, feel a little bit better right now. So, and I more hope. information. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we Obviously, don't know, I don't know right? Going to happen, but when he says that, what he means is we are still trying to do things. We still want to accomplish certain things. One left-handed hitter is not enough. They definitely want more than that. Bellinger again looms as that guy, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Be careful yeah, with rain out. What? Be careful with rain out. Fifth inning. The game's official. <laughs> he said they might be only in the fourth or fifth inning. The season, the off season ends. All of a sudden, they get a rain out. He gone. Or You're no, right. Or question, but here's the thing, Ken. If is this going to be like the full throttle comments, the <laughs> Red Sox? Because what happens if they don't sign anybody else? Then the fans are all going to say, "Oh, what happened to the fourth or fifth inning? There was so much more to come." I mean, everyone's using the full throttle against the Red Sox and Craig Breslow. So could this come back and bite them? Why? Why say anything? Just say, "Hey, we're evaluating stuff." I mean, we all want them to be honest, but at the same time, this is why owners now pre-screen questions, and this is why teams don't have fan fest because fans now remember all this stuff and they hold them against the fire. I would imagine that before Jed Hoyer said that, he knew what he was doing and he knew where they stood on multiple fronts and he is confident that they're going to get some things done. It's different than the full throttle remark. The full throttle remark was about a team that has not been full throttle for several years and suddenly was going to change the way it did things, was going to go hard free agents again and really has not to this point done that. With the Cubs, basically what he's saying is not full throttle, but we've got more things to do. And I would expect that that's going to happen. It's not like they're going to get shut out here. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's too many players left, too. It's not like we're talking about one or two players. Like, there are significant names. We didn't even get to the DHs that are still available on the market, too, and there's some pretty big names there. Big uh, maybe names. we'll get to that. Yeah, big names. Uh, J.D. Martinez, Justin Turner, Jorge Soler, etc. cetera. Uh, much more from Ken on the logo at the top there, Fair Territory, which there it is, airs uh, tomorrow. You'll get the edition tomorrow on Tuesday. And also look out for Ken's tweet um, later today asking for Grillin, uh, Grillin Ken questions. So, Ken, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we'll look forward to Fair Territory tomorrow. Thanks, guys.